Uh, my name is Hans Neldner. I'm from uh, Oregon, Wisconsin. Uh, we talk a lot uh, about a number of kinds of peaks, peak oil, peak water, uh, peak food. It strikes me that the uh, electorate in the United States is concerned about jobs right now. And I wonder what these conversations might be like if we frame them in terms of the uh, U.S. has already peaked. The problem we're experiencing right now isn't peak oil yet. It's that we've peaked in our need for the labor, of, uh, the compensated labor of other people in the United States. Because that would get right to the primary concern or the main concern for a lot of the electorate. Well, let me uh, start. Uh, th this is a, a good question. Uh, and when I, I do presentations on energy, I, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you should do renewables or energy efficiency, and, and jobs is one. Uh, that's the number one, two, three, four uh, issue for everybody in Lansing who's an elected or appointed official. And that's one thing, actually, that's been driving the, uh, the push on alternative and renewable energy. Uh, it's interesting, though, that that uh, focuses more on manufacturing, and, and I understand why that is, because uh, I talked a little about uh, manufacturing wind components and solar systems. Uh, it's interesting because there's a lot of uh, more labor-intensive activities we can do in the energy efficiency area with respect to weatherization. So in the energy field, there, there's a lot of potential to create jobs in Michigan by kind of changing what we do. I, I can speak to that real quick. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, f some folks here are familiar with, with transition towns, that notion of transition towns. Uh, and really, the premise is this notion of the transition away from fossil fuels and towards local resilience. And I think what you're, what you're speaking on, what it sort of peaked for me a little bit, was this notion of communities coming together and taking responsibility for themselves. And we're starting to see all kinds of examples emerge of when communities come together and take responsibility for their food production, a lot of things start to fall in place. Jobs get created, community expands, and we start to see this infrastructure revolve around local food systems. Um, so, you know, you mentioned uh, for, for, for all too long, we sort of, many of us have been dependent on these almost faceless, decentralized uh, utility companies and corporations and things like that for, for food and energy. And I think we're starting to see a resurgence of communities uh, stepping up, using new systems of design and taking responsibility for their food, energy, and water systems. And when we do that, we'll see the uh, corresponding economic systems uh, start to take place as well. I'll just, I'll just say one thing, and this is actually a good introduction to what I'm going to say, and that is what Nathan's talking about is that the whole definition of work is going to change. And so part of the problem in talking about jobs is that when you say the word jobs to the American electorate, or probably any electorate, they think of a certain way of working. They think of going to work at a certain time and working in a certain place and getting off and getting vacations. They think of a certain set of benefits. And uh, so I don't think it's going to be easy to just talk about jobs. I think what's going to have to happen is that there's going to have to be a little bit of explanation about what the nature of work is going to be. Some work is not going to be compensated in the way that it's been typically compensated. It may not be a paycheck. It may be, uh, you know, my wife uh, volunteers on an organic farm. We're sharecroppers. We get part of what we grow. So that's an arrangement that people haven't thought about and heard about in a long, long time, and they don't have a very, good, very good associations with it. And yet, I think it's a very viable way of thinking about how to work. It's a form of work that doesn't involve getting any money. So those are the kinds of considerations that I think we need to take into account when we talk about jobs. My name is Peter Bain, and I'm here from Bloomington, Indiana. And I apologize in advance that I have a slightly wonkish question. Um, David, when you presented on peak oil, you used the, the term or acronym EROI, mm. Energy Return on Investment. And I believe there's a certain amount of controversy right now and unclarity about this term and its parallel term, energy return on energy invested. And I would like you to comment on them if you can. Well, first, um, thanks for the question. I'm not sure I, are you talking about 
just to simplify the question, EROI versus EROEI? Yes. Essentially? The, the, the question of investment, EROI, as you used it or seem to use it, mm -hmm. hinges around currency values, which are flux in flux, whereas the other is it seems to be more absolute but harder to measure. It, it's what a, it, how much energy does it take to get the, 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 the suck on that straw? Right. It's a great thing to clarify. What I was talking about was strictly the energy return on the energy invested. So the confusion arises because the, the people who developed the theory um, have used, you know, the one acronym, but I think just because it's used so often, four letters is shorter than five, and so energy return on, in, on investment is kind of a shorthand the way we use it for energy return on energy invested. I agree. There's another term that, that I've used before that uh, it's called life cycle energy. It's basically the same concept. All right. Yeah. My name is Bill Costantino. I'm from Caledonia, right here outside of Grand Rapids. Uh, questions for John Sarver. You mentioned that the, the base load generating systems are about 50 years old. I'm just curious what your outlook is in terms of the, uh, the cost, the time, the effort, you know, the finances to, to replace that, and if we have, in your view, if we have the time to do that necessary upgrade given the whole financial uh, risk we're in. Well, and I don't have a number, but it's, it's safe to say that it's a large number <laughs> to replace those uh, baseload power plants. Uh, it's it's going to cost a lot of money, and uh, there has been a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, uh, a controversy in, in recent years here about should we have a new coal power plant in Bay City? Uh, should uh, DTE invest in a nuclear power plant uh, down in Monroe? Should we have more wind? Should we have more solar? It's interesting, a lot of times when you're in discussions, people compare the uh, cost of renewables to all the existing power plants, which of course are cheap, you know. Those old coal power plants are really cheap and the price of coal is relatively cheap. It's a ridiculous comparison because what we have to do is compare uh, alternatives to uh, the new nuclear power plants, which will be very expensive, or cleaner coal, which will be very expensive. Um, and we are, I, I wanted to mention the 50-year average thing because we are at a, uh, uh, it, it's not like it's going to be decided tomorrow, but the state of Michigan or our elected officials and our private companies are going to be making some big decisions that we're going to live with for a long time. Uh, if coal power plants or wind farms or, or whatever are built, we're all going to be paying for those in our rates for a long time. And uh, I don't have a number, but it's, we're talking about a lot of money. My name is Donna Dillman, and I'm from uh, just this side of Ottawa, Canada. Um, my question uh, concerns something that's been touched on but not really discussed, uh, and that is that it's my understanding from various things I've read that we're actually going to have to cut back in consumption about 80% uh, in order for energy to meet our needs. Um, and I'm not sure what that's exactly going to look like with an economic crash, but uh, if each of you could uh, touch on that, I'd appreciate it. I'll, I'll give it a shot. And I think what's being talked about there is because so much of our current energy source is fossil fuels, that growth in, ec in economic activity implies more use of fossil fuels. It's assuming you can get them. Um, and so there's a sort of one-to-one -one equivalence that's been laid out for growth in emissions and growth in the economy. Likewise, if we want to get emissions down and we want to get fuel use down, um, then maybe we just need to consume less. That's, that's the argument, because it's assuming that we're not going to get renewable energy that is not carbon-based in uh, great enough quantities soon enough to mitigate that uh, reduction that needs to be, take place. I you know, don't think it's going to be that severe, but I do think there's an argument to be made that as long as we are using fossil fuels, we need to consider a reduction in consumption, because practically everything we use has been made transported, transformed with fossil fuels. If you don't reduce your consumption today, uh, given our current en energy mix, 
you won't reduce uh, carbon emissions. I think this gets to the visualization issue that Kurt was touching on earlier about just how do you kind of grasp what that means to consume and why we are able to do that. So imagine you're driving your car down the highway and it breaks down so you pull over and the nearest um, repair shop is 25 miles away. So just imagine pushing your car 25 miles and that would take you, you know, days or weeks. You can do the same thing with one gallon of fuel. One gallon of gasoline will do the same work and it's just amazing when you stop and think about that's how we can design a society to do everything that we do at like this hyper speed. And people don't grasp just the, the energy density, the, I mean, we, it's really magical stuff. And we did, we did hit the jackpot, but it's, you know, it's, there's, it's, it's, it's challenged to, you know, how do you visualize the quality of that energy and what it really means? So uh, I think it's a challenge, but it's a great question. Hi, over. My name is Shay Davis, I'm from Saginaw, Michigan. I'm assistant professor of English at Delta College and I have a question for all of you. Could any of you speculate on Mr. Cobb's example of the 5% uh, we're not getting on this plane because it could fall out of the sky and the 5% civilization collapse. What is, what is the barrier, the psychological barrier that prevents people from realizing or feeling it as a real risk? Well, this is a simplification, but I, I think, uh, I mean, a big part of the problem uh, is that, you know, when we look at risk to ourselves, we perceive that much differently than risk to all of us, <laughs> uh, especially in this country where we're so uh, independent, individualistic. Uh, let them worry about themselves, basically. Uh, and I think that's, to some extent, the attitude of a uh, significant part of Americans. You know, and I think that's one reason we f find uh, different policies in Europe and Canada, uh, because there is more of a sense of we've got to worry about community risk. Um, and that's, that, uh, at least in my conversations with people, that's a, a real problem in talking about risk. If you talk about risk to me getting on a plane, that's a lot different to risk for the, the, the world. And, you know, I can't even grasp it. I think is a lot of the response. That's a question I've thought a lot about. I think a lot of us have, and I, for me, part of it is an issue of control. So if I'm if I'm deciding about my own, you know, life, you know, whether to get insurance or not for for something, I feel like I have more control to do something definite that will have you know impacts that I can see one way or the other. When you've got a, you know a, so a society full of people, it's hard to. You know, you, you, I think there's a sense of feeling less in control, and I think the the fear from that from that uh, realization is a hard place for people to go. 